next presentation is Dr. Wheeler from Penn State, and she'll be talking about an additive to try and address this issue. It's going to tie in nicely with Hosea's presentation. So please help me welcome Dr. Wheeler. Thank you. After recognizing the problem on these farms, 10 different farms that we work with Hosea and his group and a couple of other sponsors, we found that there's definitely a dangerous situation that arises on farms that use gypsum bedding. And pointing to the many advantages of it, we're not gonna stop its use, but let's find a way to not only raise awareness that there are dangerous conditions during agitation, it's very clear, but can we also look at some ways to mitigate that effect on the farm? That's where we're going with this. This isn't quite as much fun because we're gonna go into laboratory studies but I think it's important to take a look at at least what we can do in bucket scale before we take it out to the, to, to, out to the field. I get to go zipping through these slides because Jose has set me up so nicely and our, our talks are coordinated to some extent. But um, we already talked about where gypsum bedding product is coming from, the recycling of drywall material, coming in as a granular pellet or chunks. We actually work with USA Gypsum on both of these projects that Jose talked about this one here, as the manufacturer who had his own concerns about the potential dangers and then found the real dangers with the gypsum bedded product. And looking back in the barn, there's a whole host of reasons that farmers are interested in using this, from an animal welfare and animal comfort, a milk quality production system, in addition to some agronomic practices that the farmers were going to. So it's, we've got all the good associated with it, Let's just pay strict attention during that hour or two that we're agitating manure and pest gypsum bedding. Looking at some of the biologicals on this, we do know, do know why this is being caused with the addition of the, the, the high levels of sulfur in the manure. Let me just remind you of a couple of numbers here. Not all of you work with hydrogen sulfide, perhaps, but 20 part per million hydrogen sulfide over the course of the day is within the range of working conditions that humans should or, or would tolerate. When you get over 100 parts per million, it's considered immediately dangerous to life and health, which means you should move out of the area. When you're getting into levels of five to 600 parts per million, that's when people start dropping over, and the story that Hasea offered us on the two children who dropped. So they were clearly in conditions that were well over 100 parts per million. Looking at some of the anecdotal evidence we, we brought back from the on-farm study of the, of the 10 different farms, 19 different agitation events, we found some things that we couldn't look at there, but what you're gonna look at in the lab. What was the really strong smell? I'm talking malodor, of people who worked around gypsum bedded manure and talked about when they agitated it, really, really stuck. And when they put it out on the fields later, that the, the neighbors and even the farmers themselves were like, man, this is, this is getting bad. But that was all anecdotal, right? We had some other things. We obviously had dead livestock. We had professionals that were dropping. We had professional haulers that were starting to question their wisdom of, of even working around farms that had this. So here we go. We give the members of our team some personal monitors while we were working on these farms doing the agitation events because we wanted to be safe. And I told people, this is my favorite picture of the whole, <laughs> of the thousands of pictures of the project. We're all standing next to the manure, the manure tanks being agitated, and everybody's mesmerized by their, <laughs> their monitor on their hip. And they'll go, oh my gosh, look, it's alarming. And nobody moved. <laughs> so they, you know, hear the alarm and then move away from <laughs> the tank. Now your photographer, me, moved away. So I'm like, oh, I'm getting out of here. <laughs> so we continue to use this kind of technology in the lab, which are just photo, I'm sorry, they're um, electrochemical sensors that, that detect hydrogen sulfide. While we were in the field using those type of sensors, we found a couple things. One was that as you put more, more gypsum into the manure system, basically by applying more gypsum per cow per day as the bedding material, you ended up with more hydrogen sulfide emissions coming off that agitation. That kind of makes sense with a mass balance approach. We also found the lower line there with the, the red squares was an additive that was put into the manure to try to reduce the hydrogen sulfide emissions at agitation. And it did seem to work. So it was significantly different. It was a product that was supplied by the manufacturer of the gypsum bedding. So thinking about that and this, this outlier here with the, uh, the green dots, 
we had a different additive that really did. The most gypsum bedding being used in the barns and the most reduction of, of gypsum of hydrogen sulfide and agitation. But that farm also had no cross in the river. We'll talk about cross in a minute. So here's our laboratory scale trials. We had three trials completed. The results, I'm going to combine some of those here when I talk to you. We wanted to document a manure additive treatment reduction in hydrogen sulfide release from bucket scale manure during, particularly during the agitation events. We had a target additive that we were looking at that showed success elsewhere. We go out into the field. We've worked with manure for years. This is key to getting any successful data off of even bucket scale manure is the sampling process of getting that sampled and uniform samples across. It, it, it's amazing how difficult this part of it can be. You wouldn't think. So we go to a lot of trouble to, to get the proper samples spread about among our buckets, start adding the components that we were interested in, in looking at. And here's our, here's our additive looking at the many buckets we have. Over on your far side there, you've got just manure, dairy manure that we've mixed. Manure with gypsum, the white material is the gypsum. And then we started these different components of manure plus this iron oxide. Hosea talked about this drywall being a recycled material. This iron oxide is likewise a recycled material. It's from our acid mine drainage. It's picked up off of all the coal mining that went on in Pennsylvania for many years, environmental degradation. They're now reclaiming some of these sites by collecting runoff that's high in iron oxide drying it, and now we have another recycled product, which is a waste product, that we could use. We already knew this would work by other, other experiments we run and just generally in field data. So we said, let's take a look at iron oxide. What we did was we mixed it at a one-to-one -one molar ratio, the iron to the sulfur. And then we also looked at different ratios. The um, USA Gypsum folks were interested, well, why one-to-one? -one? Why don't we go half iron to to the sulfur ratio. So we, we tried some additional, additional mold ratios. So off we go on our experiments. Looking at some of the, what we, this is one of the experiments we ran, we got pretty serious about it. We actually have probably about three parts of gypsum to two parts of iron oxide. If you look at the, the poundage or the tonnage that we're gonna put into the system. The key is this could actually go into the, the cattle stall could be mixed with the gypsum bedding to start with, or it could be put into the manure storage after, after the case. We have a Fourier transfer infrared analyzer that does the work and has a special adapter on there to get the hydrogen sulfide measurements that we would like. We also collected bags uh, for odor evaluation. There's a whole process there. I'll just buzz through the, the basics of that. We have a Penn State odor assessment lab where we routinely evaluate what we call mal odors. The other thing we also did was we, we were able to document conditions mainly during the agitation. And with the change of instrumentation, we actually documented ammonia emission, or, sorry, hydrogen sulfide emissions the entire time. During agitation, each of the buckets had a dedicated mixer in it which was mixed at a certain time with the, uh, the drill assembly there. So when we get to odors, we're looking at three things in red that we were interested in. Not only the concentration of the odor through olfactometry, but the pleasantness, the intensity, and the character of the odor. And we use people to do this. Our sensors, right here in our face, are still considered the most accurate and the gold standard of odor detection. So we pay these people well. <laughs> they know when they have odors from us, it's not chocolate sauce, it's not your mother's tomato paste. It's gonna be a mal odor. And they're very, they're, they're very, very good at doing this. So they use an olfactometer as part of it, and then they also do some testing, uh, two different intensity scales to give us the, the strength of the odor. And then we also have a pleasantness scale, which gives us how bad does it smell, how pleasant does it smell. So moving on to that, some of our results. Let's get, start with the odor. It was clear that the, the manure with gypsum bedding in it had a much stronger odor as detected by this than just controlled manure. And I don't know what you might think of dairy manure, but when you add gypsum bedding to it, it almost doubled the, the concentration of odor in that, in that material. 
when we looked at pleasantness, this is, this, the scale is upside down on purpose because it is malodor and we're in the unpleasant, the, the below zero, the negative numbers of pleasantness. We never do things <laughs> above zero pleasantness. And so if you look at this, the manure with gypsum, the, the middle block here was less pleasant. It was improved with the addition of iron oxide. In fact, the iron oxide was, maybe not statistically, but it showed a trend in this and additional data to look like it was more pleasant than just straight manure. Odor intensity, we have two different scales we use to do this and there was agreement between those, but the manure with gypsum was more intense, stronger smell, which makes, tends to make it less pleasant if it's, if it's strong. And the iron oxide reduced it back down to about the level of controlled manure in both, both scales, which is nice, sometimes you don't get agreement with both scales. The other thing you'll notice, we have to be fair about odor evaluations. I mean, we are the evaluator, right? It's my nose, your nose, your nose. And it's, it's not, there's a lot of variation. So you look at the air bars on here for the standard deviations. They're quite large. And that's a function of, of our instrumentation system, which is us. Looking at the results for iron oxide, highly reduced the amount of the iron oxide highly reduced the amount of hydrogen sulfide coming <coughs> off of the manure systems. Let me walk you through this just briefly. Control manure, just dairy manure. Manure plus the gypsum, quite strong hydrogen sulfide concentrations. Let's look at the numbers over here. This is just 15 kilograms of dairy manure. And just in an agitation of them, we've got, remember I told you 100 part per million hydrogen sulfide is immediately dangerous to life and health? We're in the thousands, just off of a bucket of manure, which is a pretty scary thing when you multiply that out by a uh, manure storage. Here's the, the manure with gypsum with the iron oxide at a one to one ratio. And I'll just stop here because you can see that that ratio re not only reduced the hydrogen sulfide emissions to at or below what we found in the control number. And the rest of the, the recipes that we have really didn't perform as well. So we moved on from here and kept looking at iron oxide. But it's clear that the iron oxide was, was performing as expected. Hydrogen sulfide concentration over time, all these tests we did, at, you know, mixing the manure, we did some evaluations day one, sometimes 36 hours later, sometimes um, a month later, two months, three months later. And we're again showing that over time, over time and over, over time, we just had much better performance of reducing hydrogen sulfide with using the iron oxide. So in summary, iron oxide at this one-to-one -one molar ratio gave us the best control in reducing hydrogen sulfide emissions from the manure that had gypsum bedding. The iron oxide also, surprisingly, and, and is, a, is a very big benefit, reduced the odors. As any, way we, any way we measured it, it improved the odor characteristics of that gypsum bed. That, that's all I had to present you, but I'd like to entertain a question or comment or discussion. just the gypsum or I feel like they'd be already immersed in yes. anything afterwards. That's a good point. Yeah. Is, is the odor, the presentation of the odor, odorous manure to the people. There's a lot, there's a lot to answer that. One is that they, they are limited in the amount of samples that they take in a day because you do get used to an odor, whether it's good or bad. That's part of it. We do randomly mix it. They also have non-odorous stuff that they smell, <coughs> background blanks and background um, <coughs> test uh, and butanol is a standard that we use that they have, as they're doing all these samples, they have to come in in a certain range or their whole data sets thrown out. So each, if they have five samples is usually our max, they do each of them two to three times and they're randomly mixed. In the olfactometer, it's a, it's a very, very diluted stream that they, that they end up monitoring. They can barely detect it. When they get to the test where they actually take, take what I call the bag of steak, they, they press on it, and there's a, there's a little funnel that comes out, 
and then they get the full the full odor. They don't stick their nose; mm -hmm. it's back here, and they, they push it toward themselves. So they don't get a lot, and, and they can pick up they can pick up odor character and all this stuff, which is amazing. We've had them do dozens of manure amendments, and they didn't know what we were presenting them, and they started picking up odor character that was peppermint, minty. <laughs> Like, like, you know, checking that off when they know what we test. And it turned out there was a, a black Mitchum peppermint as an additive that we had put in, and they picked it up. <laughs> yeah, so they're good, yeah. But th that's a good question because yeah. they would fatigue. Yeah. And you have the next one, and then I'll get in the back. Yeah, yeah I saw the one chart we had a dry match. What yes. in that product? Good. The dry mat didn't help us at all. When you added the iron oxide, then it did help. And dry mat is a combination of the gypsum bedding with limestone. And again, it's a product that's mainly put on the floor of the dairy barn, sometimes used in the stall. And it's three quarters gypsum and about a quarter limestone. And then there's also a secret ingredient that we were never told <laughs> at, um, at a, a very minor amount, probably about a quarter or a half a percent. I guess the common in our region is probably hard to find this under oxide reduction in our area. I wonder if this would be an alternative product that we use or whether you can access it. Yeah, you're asking about the availability of iron oxide. The people we get it from are they commercially harvest it, dry it, and sell it. So even though it's in Pennsylvania, I'm sure they ship it. So if that answers that question. Were you also asking about the dry mat? The dry mat's available. It, it's manufactured in Pennsylvania. It's, I know they ship it to Wisconsin. But the dry mat itself did not give us a reduction in hydrogen sulfide. So the other good reasons to use it for the agronomic reasons and the, the cattle bedding reasons. But unless the iron oxide was added to it, we really didn't find um, a benefit to it for that purpose. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I got the guy in the orange. Sorry. So during decomposition, the microbes prefer oxidized iron mm -hmm. to thermal electrolytes after or they hit the salt yes, and yep. use it. So is it reducing the iron and then the iron too is acting to inhibit formation? Do you know about the mechanism of how the how it stops hydrogen sulfide formation or is it just a, uh, a competitor? The substrates get utilized with the uh, oxidized iron versus, versus the Anybody hear his question? I'm not a microbiologist, so I may not be the best one to answer this, so maybe there's other people in the room that could. But you're correct, completely correct in that what we've done is give the microbes that are in there some iron that they will preferentially use in their, their oxidation and reduction systems, right? And so they use that first, and I believe they're tying it up because the sulfur is still in the manure. I didn't tell you about everything we tested. We have all kinds of samples in manure. The sulfur is still there. It just did not get converted to H2S. And I'm sure there's other people that are better at describing this. But you're, it, it used, it, you, well, our, our goal was to use something other than the sulfur to, to, break, to not have it break down and go toward H2S. I would guess you're making mackinaw rye, spare salt dye, uh, and not pyrite. You know, that mackinaw rye, more fuel fast, like that. Okay, so this bites it up. So as soon as you get some ferrous iron, and it turned black. We have a bunch of other questions. Oh, yeah. Yeah, One more. Uh, we have the, the lady there. Were you going to talk about the cross? Oh, I forgot to mention the cross. <laughs> <laughs> that was key, both in the field and in the study, with the Hosea study. The, the manure systems that had cross really did not have H2S release in between agitation. And even in our bucket system, once we broke up that crust and got it started, uh, got that mixed in, that's when the, the hydrogen sulfide is in the solution. It stays in there. And if it doesn't have a chance to off-gas it, it's going to release that agitation. We did work on other uh, amendments earlier on, even before the field trial. And we could show that if you didn't have a crust, you kind of off-gas the H2S over, over constantly. As soon as you have the crust, it keeps it in there, agitate, boom. So preventing a crust on your storage? That's one, that's one option. One option. Yeah. If you put some, some uh, iron oxide in there, you I wouldn't go, I wouldn't go sweet. <laughs> Please help me thank you.